بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الولي الحميد الفعال ما يريد وصلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد الله صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين وسيما بقية الله في العرضين أرواحنا له فدا أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه المجيد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يريد الله من يبين لكم ويهديكم سنن الذين من قبلكم ويتوب عليكم والله عليم حكيم صدق الله علي العظيم Allah SWT states that He desires to make clear for you and we spoke that this thing which Allah SWT wants to make clear is the religious law, is the way of life that a Muslim should live, that a believer should live and he desires to guide you by the customs, by the tradition of those who have come before you and particularly as this verse is referencing by the traditions of the prophets who have come before and he also wishes and desires to grant you repentance for surely Allah he is all-knowing he is wise our discussion has been on this topic of how to maintain faith in our time, particularly with the struggle between tradition and change. Till now we have spoken about two, at least pillars of this faith, or two things that we should have with us in order to maintain faith. On one hand, it is the tradition, but a tradition, as Allah SWT, he speaks in verse 26 of Surah Nisa, a tradition that is grounded in knowledge, a tradition that is focused on guidance, guiding you. And having a tradition as such, that the tradition is grounded in that which is intelligible. That which, again, in it there is knowledge. And your understanding how to apply it is wisdom. On one hand, this is what we should have. And we spoke about this in the very beginning. And yesterday we also spoke, and the day before, about the other aspect or the other thing which we need in order to maintain faith, and that is the Qur'an. And developing a relationship with the Qur'an. Following the guidance of Ahlul Bayt to make Qur'an a part of our lives, recite the Qur'an such that, as Imam Sadiq, he says, that the Qur'an becomes mixed with your blood and with your flesh. In other words, become insan Qur'aniyun wa Qur'anun nartaq, however you want to express it. To become the walking, talking, speaking Qur'an, something that is possible for each and every one of us. And we see that the true students of Ahlul Bayt والسلام, that they reached to this point. Though they were not one of the 14 Ma'asumin, but because they followed the life of the Prophet, followed the life of Ahlul Bayt, and learned as they should have learned, then they became these walking, talking, speaking Quran, such as Filda who spoke by the Qur'an. You ask her anything about her life, she spoke by that Qur'an. So this is a summary of all of what we have 
spoken about until now, or if you like, you can say that these two things which we have explained over these days, it can be summed up in the hadith of Rasulullah when he says, Inni tarikum fikum al-thaqilain kitabullah wa ijrati ahlul bayt. Man tamassaka bihima, man yadillu abada. That I am leaving behind two weighty things, the book of Allah and my family and whoever takes both of them. Not one of them, but both. And we explained yesterday why both. That both of these things are complementary to one another. That if the Ahlul Bayt, they are Qur'an al Nataq, then their actions coincide with the Qur'an. Their speech coincides with the Qur'an. And we see on several occasions, as the Imams, they mentioned, they said that if they say something or if they do something, you can ask them, where is this action or where is this statement in the Qur'an? <coughs> so this is what we need. These are the two things that we need. And by holding to those two things and, again, making it a part of our lives, not simply following any tradition, custom, anything that comes about, and if it's not grounded in knowledge, and that knowledge, again, is going to be grounded in the Qur'an. This is why we are to take both of them. Because we mentioned that sometimes the, or at least one of the possible reasons why the traditions of Ahlul Bayt, alayhim al-Sadrusam, has not taken its proper place within the Ummah, has not taken its proper place within the community, is because there are things that are said, oh, we should do this or we should do that. This is the tradition of Ahlul Bayt. But when we actually examine them closely, we see that, no, these are not your tradition. The traditions of Ahlul Bayt do not contradict the Quran. Your traditions and the way of life of Ahlul Bayt will not contradict the Quran. And this is why the Prophet he says, hold fast to both of them. Examine them both together. And this is one thing that's, if you want to practice this or you want to see this, and you're someone who does some research or a little bit of research, I will say, take the Sahih for the Sajjadiyya. This will be maybe a little bit more easy for you. Take Sahih for the Sajjadiyya of Imam Zayn al Abidin, alayhi wa salatu wa salam. And as you read the Sahih for the Sajjadi of Imam Zainu Abidin, you compare it with the Qur'an, with the teachings of the Qur'an. And subhanAllah, you'll see that these two things are running parallel. That what Imam Zainu Abidin, he teaches and he states in the Qur'an, is there in, or in the Sahih for the Sajjadi, is there in the Qur'an. And I'll give you just one quick example, so as not to focus on this, because this is an aside. But one of the things that Imam Zain al Abidin he does in Sahih al Sajjadiyya, and he does so with a goal and an objective. That almost every hadith, every dua in Sahih al Sajjadiyya begins with Salawat ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. And we also find in several, not only in the beginning, in the middle, at the end, there's salutations upon the Prophet Muhammad and his Ahlul Bayt. This coincides precisely with that verse where in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says that in Allah wa malaikatu yusalluna ala nabi ya ayyuhalladina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. <laughs> that owe you that surely Allah SWT and his angels they give salutations to the Prophet Muhammad and oh you who believe Allah SWT is speaking to the believers those who claim that they have Iman and faith he says if you believe then you give salutations upon the Prophet as well so from this we see the objective 
of Imam Zain al-Abidin that why is he giving so many salutations in the du'as? Again, to remind people of faith and Iman. Again, to produce individuals who are believers, who have Iman. This is the subjective. And we see that him making this statement when he's coming back into Medina after being in prison, after or when he comes back into Medina, he says, in Medina you will not you will not find more than twenty people who have love of Ahlubayt, who even know who the Ahlubayt are. So then he begins to teach through du'a and teaching people faith and iman through du'a. And one of those things which will instill faith, which will protect faith, which will maintain faith is the salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So this is why Imam Zain Abidin does this. But again, the point is how what the Imam is teaching through du'a, how it parallels with the Qur'an. It is in sync with the teachings of the Qur'an. And as our discussion is about this idea and this concept of maintaining faith, maintaining Iman, we know that the two pillars of that Iman is the tradition grounded in knowledge and the Qur'an. But what exactly is Iman? What is it that we need? And what is it that we should be striving for? What is the reality of Iman and faith? Imam Ja'far Sadiq alayhi alayhi wa sallatu wa sallam He states, Inna min haqiqat al-Iman an tu'thar al-haq وَإِنْ ذَرَّكَ عَلَى الْبَاطِلِ وَإِنْ نَفَعَكَ وَإِنْ لَا يُجُوزَ مَنْتِكُكَ عِلْمَكَ He says, from the reality, حقيقة to the Iman, that if you want to understand what is true faith, he says, truth faith lies in this. And تؤثر الحق That true faith will project itself in truth. That one who has true faith, real faith, real belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then his entire existence, his entire being will reflect truth. Haq. He says, وَإِن ذَرَّكَ عَلَى الْبَاطِلِ So much so that the individual, he will speak truth, he will act by truth. He will act by that which is right. Even if it led to one's own detriment in face of that which is wrong. Meaning that if a person had to choose between right and wrong, lying or telling the truth, and if he lies, then that person will be safe. That person will not, you know, he, he will not lose his money, or he will, he will, nothing bad will happen. Oh, he lied, and he disclosed, he, did, he hit what the truth was. Versus telling the truth and speaking the truth and living by that truth, but the results is that there will be some short, sort of harm, harm, not actually physical harm or death, but there will be some sort of loss. وَإِنْ ذَرَّكَ عَلَى الْبَاطِلِ that there was something that was lost. And this is, again, what Karbala is about. That if Imam Hussein, he said, that, okay, well, I really don't believe that Yazid is the rightful Khalifa, or he should be in power, and I make bayat to him. That the community will not be harmed, and he knows that the community will not be harmed. He says, oh, we'll, we'll, we'll overlook this. Well, my brother overlooked it. But that's a different situation. He made peace, so maybe I should make peace. When Yazid is openly doing what is wrong. So Imam is saying, he says, no, this is right. Can I remain silent on this? What happened in the past, there were things that were going on, things which were hidden, 
But now in Yazid, he has brought these things out to the open. But he is doing things directly against the Sharia, directly against Islam, to destroy Islam. So Imam is saying, no, we cannot remain silent. So living by truth, again, whether that truth, it also aids you and assists you. Again, a part of an example and one of the signs of true faith is that your expressions, your speech, what you talk about, what you deliver, what you convey to others, that those things, your words, do not transgress or go beyond your level of knowledge. In other words, that if you know this much, then you don't you do not try to convey that you know more than what you actually know. That a person stays within his or her level of knowledge and conveys that. Of course, the believer goes and tries to learn as much as he or she can. As the Prophet says, that seek knowledge from the cradle to the grave. But as one is seeking knowledge, as one has gained knowledge, one does not speak above, again, their ability. This is a sign of true iman. Yet, again, remaining within that context of truth and not allowing anything to affect that. This world, position, the offers that have been given. And this is what happened again in the other camp. That these individuals, that they know, they knew who Imam Hussein was. They knew who the family of Ahlul Bayt were. They knew them. But yet, they were offered position, they were offered wealth. But they claimed, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. At least this is what their claim was. They claimed that they had faith. But when it came to test that faith, we see the results. So on one hand, true faith is this. Within the teachings of Ahlul Bayt as they speak about this idea and this concept of faith which we need to at least get a grasp upon, at times they say that a person la yastahik or a servant la yastahikku abudun haqiqat al-iman and at times they say la yastakmilu abudun haqiqat al-iman Sometimes they express this idea of obtaining or gaining or receiving or being blessed by having true faith. They explain it almost as a, a blessing, yes, the hip, deserving. That a person does not deserve true iman until they have done these things. And at times it's, it's stated that a person does not obtain, yes, that that their iman does not become complete or whole or true iman until they do certain things. And we'll explain this in the next few days as well. We'll kind of explain this out very thoroughly. With regards to the completion of faith and obtaining true iman, Imam states in Imam Sada, he says, لا يستكمل عبد حقيقة الإيمان حتى يكون في خسار ثلاث He says, a person does not begin to complete his faith and achieve true faith and Iman until he has three traits and three characteristics about himself or herself. The first, he says, التفقه Thinking, contemplating, studying one's faith. This is the first condition. That if one claims that I am Muslim, I am Shia, I am a follower of Ahlul Bayt, then it is incumbent upon you 
to examine that which you believe in, or you are claiming to believe in. That what does it mean to be Muslim? What does it mean to be a follower of Ahlul Bayt? Is it simply because I have a name? My name is Hussein, my name is Abbas, my name is Ali. Or does it take more than that? That we must go forth, you see that? What does it mean to be Mashiach? What does it mean to be a follower of Ahmad Bayt? One of the examples we've, gave, we've given already. And that is to be one like Fidda. She was true Shia. She was a true follower of Ahlul Bayt. She was someone, again, she, who knew the Quran so well that you ask her anything, anything about her life, she was able to reference it to the Quran. The Shuhada of Karbala, again, these were examples. Individuals who knew the Quran, who knew the teachings of Ahlul Bayt and Imam Muhammad and throughout history, there are individuals, again, when we read their lives, and you see that, subhanAllah, these are really those who follow the Ahlul who learn from the Ahlul Bayt, who again try to embody the teachings of Ahlul Bayt, alayhim wa So Imam says, the first means of completing your game is having to faqqah for deen. And to faqqah for deen, again, it comes from the root fiqh. Doesn't mean that you have to become a jurist or a mushrik. No. To faqqah for deen, think, read, examine your faith. In fact, the Imam Sadiq, he stated, afqahu nas, that the one who is most faqih, here it means the one who understands most about their deen and their faith, he says, Man arafa ma'ala the kalamina, that individual who understands the place of our hadith, our statements, that individual who understands how to apply our teachings to their lives. He says, This is the one who is afqa. This is the one who has in depth understanding about his or her faith. That they've read the lies of Ahlul Bayt, they have studied the hadith, the traditions of Ahlul Bayt, and they understand how to apply it to their lives. The second endeavor that we must undertake in order to obtain true faith, the Imam he says, "Wa husnul taqdir fil ma'isha." Subhanallah. That living, I'll translate it in this way because this is a better say, living a balanced life. Good measure, if you want to translate it very literally, so you may understand. Having good measure or planning in your life. In other words, living a balanced life, living a wholesome life. Understanding, again, how to live properly. Not being too extravagant, nor being too cheap. The best of ways is to have that balanced life. There was, at one point, the prophet, he came across a group of individuals who were traveling, just to give you some idea. They were traveling, and when the Prophet, he asked them, he says, who are you? They claimed, they said that, نَحْنُ مُؤْمِنُونَ That we are the believers. So the Prophet, he asked him, he says, so what is the sign of your Iman? That you are true believers. So they stated that, that well, we rely upon Allah SWT. We are content with His decree for us. And we submit to Allah. The Prophet of Allah responded, he says, well, if this is true, then you have learnt, learnt this teachings, and you are able to apply it to your life. And he states, he says, وَلَا تَبْنُونَ مَا لَا تَسْكُنُونَ فِي وَلَا تَجْمَعُونَ مَا لَا تَأْكُلُونَ He says, 
if this is true, he says, then don't build anything. In other words, don't build a house, don't build anything that you're not going to live in. Nor do you collect things, food or anything, that you're not going to use. He says, yes, and this will be your sign. is this. That you're not obtaining and acquiring things, again, that you're not going to use, that you're not going to eat, storing things and hoarding things. Fortunately, sometimes we have this custom in this tradition, especially in the West. This is custom of buying. If you don't get it now, you're going to miss the sale. Black Friday is coming. Oh, day after Christmas sale is coming. Buy it, buy it, buy it. Save it until next year. You can give it to someone or, hey, you just have an extra gadget, shirt, shoes, whatever. It's on sale. You're not going to find this deal again. Or you're going to have to wait till next year. So you're constantly bombarded with, oh, buy, buy, buy. And you're not going to use it. Or you're going to put it aside. You're going to forget about it. Then the only time you realize that you have that thing is that when you when you start to move, oh, I'm moving from this apartment to that apartment, and then you start packing everything away. Like, oh, I had this? Oh, I, I forgot I even bought this thing. This contradicts the person of Takadir. That if you want to, again, gain the best of Iman, or complete your Iman, have this type of life, that you're not collecting, you're not hoarding, you're taking from this dunya what? you need. Not more, not less. This is what I need. And I'll take this, I'll use this, and move on. Because when our souls move on, all of those things will stay behind. The third thing which we need in order to complete our Iman, as Imam he says, he says, وَالصَّبْرُ and patience in face of calamities and tribulations. That when you are facing difficulties, and this difficulty, especially if one is a believer or at least striving to be a believer, that difficulty is there in order to enhance your iman, to enhance your faith. And know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will not try you or test you or put the difficulty in front of you, except for that you can bear it. Meaning that everything is before you to, in order to bear that difficulty. The teachings of Ahlul Bayt and the the Quran, scholars or whatever, meaning that you have access to knowledge. You have access to examples. You may have it within yourself, that knowledge and understanding within yourself on how to deal with this difficulty. How to surmount that task which is in front of you. But it needs patience to deal with. At times we may not understand it. Why am I faced with this? What is its purpose? And in face of those difficulties, again, we get two different types of people. One that will just give up and turn away and or assume and Allah SWT he knows mankind very well. As one verse says, he says, as long as man is in ease, he thinks, oh, alhamdulillah, subhanAllah, I have, I have blessings, Allah has blessed me with this. He says, as soon as they are faced with difficulties, they're like, oh, Allah has punished me. I, maybe you know, Allah is making you a better individual. He's placing you through these trials and these tests so that you may, again, come out like gold. So that you may, again, elevate your iman, raise your faith. Allah SWT, he says in I believe, Surah Al-Rum, the beginning of Surah Al-Rum, he states 
that do people think that they will be left alone to say that they believe and they will not be chested, they will not be drowned, la yuftanun. And subhanAllah, again, preciseness in what Allah SWT says, wa la yuftanun, wa hasik al nas a yuqulu amanna, wa hum la yuftanun. Do they think that they will be left to say that oh, I believe, I have Iman, and they will not be tested? The word that he uses for tested is from fitna. And what does fitna mean? Again, we and the common a common understanding of fitna is that oh well, fitna is something bad. But when we look at the teachings of Ahlul Bayt, they say, no, fitna is going to come. And don't pray to Allah SWT that you don't face fitna. He says Imam Ali, he says, pray that you are not misguided by fitna. <clears throat> but you will be tested with tragedy. You will be tested with difficult situations. And according to the teachings of Ahlul Bayt, he says that, that fitna, this is what the word actually means, he says, when you extract gold, one of the process, or the processes of separating gold that is maybe embedded in rock and other things is that you put that gold or you put that rock and gold into a container and you heat it at a very high heat to the point that the melt the gold melts and it separates from the other things says, this is fitna fatana Imam Sadiq, he says, and you will see this happening. In fact, he says, and he specifically states about this Shia, he says, you will see that as time goes on, he says, that people would be tested, they would be tried, just as the gold is heated up and extracted from the rubbish, the rock, which is not gold. He says, mankind will face tests in the same way. Until we see that those who are pure, those who will follow the Ahlubayt, that they will be distracted and separated from others. One of those tests is Karbala. And if we really looked at the history of Karbala, that who was fighting against Imam Hussein? Even among some of those who we look upon them as the worst of worst of characters. Shimmer, for example. If we just simply look at, speak about Karbala, oh Shimmer. Shimmer fought alongside of Imam Ali. Shimmer was with Imam Ali in the Battle of Safi. Shimmer was from Kufa. And even at one point in the history, Imam Ali, he told Shimmer, he says, you will be the one who murders my son, Hussein. And at that time, Shimmer, he says, how can this be? He says, Ya Ali, I, I love you, I love your children. How can I be this one? But when the test came to choose Iman or faith over choosing this dunya, we see what his choice was. That was his choice. Why? Because he did not complete his iman. We remember the tragedy of Karbala. For this purpose, as Imam Sadiq stated, that one of the things that you need in order to complete your iman, a sabr ala razaya, patience in the face of tragedy, calamities, test. We listen, we commemorate, we remember the shuhada of Karbala. We remember their tragedy, their tests, what they faced, so that we may be given strength to face our difficulties in life.
because truly what we face cannot be compared to what Imam Hussein he faced in Karbala. Our difficulties and our trials of life cannot be compared to what Imam Hussein he saw in Karbala as each one of his companions they fell to the ground as they became shaheed as the family of Rasulullah they all began to go forth and to become sacrifices to defend Islam that what tragedy that Imam Hussein faced but even we can say that at least those who went out onto the battlefield, most of those who went out onto the battlefields, they went out onto the battlefield with a sword, defending Islam. But there was one shaheed that could not even lift the sword, and this was the young baby of Imam Hussein, Abdullah ibn Abdullah. It stated that once all of the companions, the family of the Ahlul Bayt, they had all become martyred that Imam Hussein, he went out on the battlefield and he began to cry out, <laughs> Is there anyone who will come to the aid and defend the family of Rasulullah? <laughs> These are the words of Imam Hussein. Is there anyone who has faith? Is there anyone who fears what Allah may do to those who are who are killing the Ahl Bayt? He said, Is there anyone who will help us? When Imam Hussein he gave this cry, he called out. There was one person who came forth, and that was Imam Ali, Imam Zain al Abidin. It stated that Imam Zain al Abidin he grabbed his sword to go forth to help Imam Hussein. But he was leaning on his sword, and he had a staff in the other hand because Imam Zain Abidin, he was weak, he was ill during the battle of Karbala. When Imam Hussein he saw that his son, Imam Zain al Abidin, came forth to help, Imam Hussein says, What are you doing, my son? And then Imam Hussein he called Zainab al Kubara, that Ya Zainab, oh my sister, take his. Zayn al Abidin, take him back into the tents. He cannot sacrifice himself. He is the Imam after me. And then it stated in the narrations that Imam Hussein he asked for his son Abdullah. Of course, some say that this was Ali Asghar, but Ali Asghar Abdullah they were one. That Imam Zayn al Abidin, Imam Hussein he asked for his son. He says, maybe I can give him some water. And this young baby, he took him to the, to the battlefield. According to some narrations, it said that Imam Hussein, he asked for water. He says that, please give me water just for this baby. And if you think that I will drink the water, I will place this baby before you come and you take him with you to feed him. Just give him some water, something to drink, because his mother has not been able to produce milk for days because she has not drank. It said that the army of, of Yazid, they began to dispute among themselves that some were saying that give the sick baby, give him some water. Others were saying no. And then Umar ibn Sa'd, he told Hurmala, he says, Hurmala, that if we do not stop this debate among our army, among our men, our army will fall apart. He says, take your arrow and end this debate. So Hurmala, he took the arrow and he shot it towards Imam Hussein. This arrow pierced the throat of Ali Asghar. This, throat, this arrow pierced this young baby, Abdullah. It said that the blood flowed from the neck of Abdullah from Al Yasgar into the hands of Imam Hussein. He said that one handful of blood Imam Hussein he tossed towards the sky. He said that another handful of blood Imam Hussein he wiped upon his beard. And then Imam Hussein, he wondered that how could he take this young baby back to his mother? How could he take this baby back to Umr Bab? <laughs> that he took this baby just to give him some water, but now he has become shaheed. He said in hesitation, Imam Hussein, he began to walk towards the tent, but he will walk back and go back towards the tent seven times, <laughs> saying, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raju. <laughs> 
بقلت سكننا لله وإنا إليه راجعون and then as stated in the narration that Imam Hussein he heard he heard a cry out this call said to Imam Hussein that oh Hussein it is time to part with this son of yours that surely he will be given a drink of water in paradise we don't know that who this statement came from? Was it someone who was just standing by? Or was this say, was this saying from one of the angels? We don't know. It's not said. Who said this? But Imam Hussein, he took Ali Asghar, he took this young baby back to the camp. And this was the only shaheed who was buried. But again, the tragedy of Ali Asghar, the tragedy of this young baby did not end here. Imam Hussein, I don't know if he knew, but how his heart was broken when he he saw this young baby die in his hand, he would have been devastated to know that once the shohada, once their heads were taken and they were put upon spears, that when Umar ibn Isad, he looked to the heads and he began to count the heads of the shohada. <laughs> When he began to count the heads, he knew, he, Umar ibn Sa'd noticed that there was one head missing. This was the head of the young baby of Imam Hussein. Then he ordered his men to take their spears and pierce it into the sands until the body of Ali Askar was pierced. It pierced him in his chest. They pulled the, this body out of the ground and decapitated this young baby and put his head upon the spear. <laughs> Allah by the blessing of this commemoration of Imam Hussein forgive our sins, cover our shortcomings cure our ill ones have mercy upon our deceased ones Please in the reappearance of Imam Zaman make us among his helpers, his companions and those who sacrifice our lives for him Mahatma Hussein